Would you open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3? And you're probably thinking to yourself, wait a minute. Pastor Brian preached last week and the week before that. You preached from here. Did you forget? No, I preached from Exodus chapter 3 on an encounter that Moses had with God on a place called Mount Horeb. And I entitled the message, The Horrible Encounter. The Horrible Encounter. And if you were at the second service last week, I mean two weeks ago, we experienced, didn't we, a horrible encounter with God. We got out of the ordinary routine, and we chose to turn aside from that routine. And what happened? God show, showed up in a marvelous way. And if you were here in that service, uh, poor Sharon down there, she was sick that week. And she goes, just the week I miss, it's a good service. <laughs> She's been coming here for five years. She misses one service that turns out to be the one. <laughs> but God showed up two weeks ago. And, and so I, I just want to continue in Exodus chapter 3. And I don't normally do this because I'm not a person who, who likes doing a lot of series. I've only done one of them. But I'm going to make a, a short series out of this. It's going to be the, the horrible series. And last, two weeks ago, was a horrible encounter. And this week, we want to look at the horrible revelation. The horrible revelation. Chapter 3, starting at verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Church, I want you to know today that I am has sent me to you. Has sent this word to you. God calls to Moses out of the burning bush and he tells him that he has a divine assignment for him to do. He has seen his people suffer for too long under this in slavery in Egypt. And when Moses meets with God by the burning bush, he gets his marching orders and he asks the Lord this question in verse 13. He said, now they may say to me, what is his name? And he says, what shall I say to them? And now Moses gets the Horb Hill revelation. Verse 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. As I was reading this chapter, I noticed something interesting in here. That the chapter is filled with two little four-word phrases. And over and over throughout the chapter, it says this. Moses said to God, and God said to Moses, Moses said to God, and God said to Moses. You see, that's the kind of communication that we have to have with the Lord. We say to God in prayer, He says to us in the Word, and in the preaching of the Word, and the prophetic Word. And sometimes we're good at praying, 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 and I always say that's because we like to do all the talking. But it's a two-way thing. Moses said to God, and God said to Moses. So I think God has something to say to you today. So Holy Spirit, would you open every ear? I want to rebuke drowsiness. I want to re rebuke complacency. And Lord, I pray that there would be a new quickening in our spirit to receive the word of God today. In Jesus' name, amen. He spoke to Moses and he said, I am who I am. That may mean nothing to you. But when you get a revelation of what that name means, it's Yahweh. I am who I am. When you get a revelation of what that name means, let me tell you something. It will make all the difference in your life. So stay awake. Stay with me. I try hard to keep you awake. 
God was saying to Moses, and Moses, before you can do anything, before you can face anything, he's saying to us, you have to understand one basic thing about me. I am. And if you miss the meaning of this statement, you are going to struggle with problems and difficulties in life itself because it is not I was. It is not I will be. It is not I am not. It is I am. There's a lot of denominations out there today that he is rendered as I was. I used to do miracles. I used to give out the gifts. I used to heal. But they're missing it. And then there are some who think that he is the I will be. Someday we're going to get it. Someday he'll do it. Someday he'll show up. And to a vast number of people, he is even I am not. Meaning, I don't, God doesn't exist. Well, let me tell you, the Bible says in Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You don't just have to say with your mouth, there is no God to be a fool. It doesn't say a fool says with his mouth, although you are a fool if you say that. It says a fool says in his heart, there is no God. What does that mean? Even if you don't say that there's no God, if you live like there's no God, you're a fool. We live in a world with a lot of foolish people. We, our kids go to school with many foolish teachers and foolish professors. We have some foolish people running for president of the United States. Why? They may say one thing, but by their actions, their hearts are saying there is no God. And it doesn't matter what the professors say. It doesn't matter what the politicians say. It doesn't matter what society says. God said, I am who I am. Now that's the starting point. You come to that realization and everything in your life will flow out of that. There's a Mercy Me song that some of you are familiar with with the title, You Are, I Am. So I want to use that title as my three points today. You are, I am. The first Horeb Hill revelation says you are, I am. With the emphasis on the word are. And that is kind of like God speaking to us. God is telling us you are, I am. A revelation of who we are. Verse 11. Look at verse 11. Moses said to God, who am I? Now this could mean Who am I in such a way that a questioning of your ability, a questioning of your worth, and, and, uh, you know, you're looking at your limitations. And really, that's what he's asking. Who am I? But it also could serve to mean, who am I as far as a question of identity? Who am I? When God called to Moses in verse 4, you got to get this. This just stuck right out at me. Look at verse 4. God calls to Moses in verse 4. And what does Moses say? Here, This is what Moses says. Here I am. And over there he says, who am I? So what does that mean? He knew where he was. He just didn't know who he was. First service really got that one. You may be here today and you know where you are. But let me ask you, do you know who you are? What is your identity? Who am I? It's the most basic question that you can ask that will lead to the most important answer that you'll ever find. The key to salvation is knowing who you are. We have to admit, we have to confess. (laughs) Thank you. That was just your kind of glory right there. Thank you. It was almost at the right spot, too. Confession. I am a sinner. We have to know who we are. Because people don't want to admit they're a sinner. In Genesis chapter 32, we find that God wrestles a confession out of this man, Jacob. And he says to Jacob, he says, what is your name? And basically, he says, who are you? And Jacob says, with his head down, I think. 
My name is Jacob. Why? Because his name revealed who he was. He was a trickster. He was a conniver. He was a swindler. And he had to face who he was. He had to face his nature. He had to face his identity. And what does God do once we face our identity and our nature? God gives him a new name that revealed a new nature, a new name that revealed a new identity. And he goes from Jacob to Israel. Hallelujah. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? You see, Moses didn't see himself the way that God saw him. Now, you got to catch this. He doesn't know who he is because he doesn't know who God is. You're not going to know who you are until at first you know who God is. You will never know what your purpose is until you first know who God is. Who you are depends on who God is to you. You cannot get your identity from a position. Positions are good. Oh, we love our positions, but that's not your identity. You can't get your identity from your position because once the position is gone, so is your identity. You cannot get your identity from performance, whether you're a talented musician or teacher or preacher or whatever it is, because once you are unable to perform, you lose your identity. You cannot get your identity from your popularity, because once your popularity is gone, you lose your identity. I said this morning, I went through a little crisis in my life back when I was playing in the band, and we had a good thing going. And all of a sudden, the the band wanted to take a different direction on the music than I wanted to take. And I didn't want to go that way, so instead of them going my way, they all left me. The entire band left and started another band. And the next week, I was playing with another band somewhere, but I felt like I lost my identity. Because why? My identity was in my position and performance and popularity. Our identity has to be found in Christ Jesus. Who you are depends on who God is to you and what Christ is in you. Then, who am I can also be a question of our worth. Our weaknesses and limitations. Remember, for the past 40 years, Moses was living far below his, uh, his potential. He had come from royalty, and here he was for 40 years taking care of sheep on the backside of the wilderness. The only thing that he ever led out were the sheep into the pasture, and now he was called upon to lead some 3 million people out of a country that was not willing to let him go. So Moses felt inadequate. Who am I that you should call me? I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing. Have you ever felt like that? So he says, who am I? I'm just an 80-year-old man. I'm just a tired, worn-out shepherd. I'm just a has-been. How in the world can God use me? Well, some of you people who are in your 80s approaching there, your best days are coming. You are... I am is also a confession of a possession. What do I mean by that? Whenever you say the words, I am, whatever follows those two words is a confession that you're going to possess. I am sick. I am stupid. I am fat. We hear everything up here. And we see everything too. I am, right, we look in the mirror and what do we say? I am ugly. What are we doing? It's a confession that we possess. I am a terrible parent. 
We trap ourselves with these I am's. We trap our bodies with sickness. We tra trap our bodies with disease. We trap our bodies with generation curses. This runs in my family, so I'm going to get it. They're like m mouth traps. When we say it, we trap our bodies into these things. And if we're not careful what you confess, you will have what you shouldn't have, and you'll be what you shouldn't be. A mouth trap. So who am I? You are what you confess. Listen to the words of God in Joel 3.10. Let the, you got to catch this. This is, this is astounding. Let the weak say I'm strong. Now it doesn't say the person is strong. The person is weak. But he's not confessing that he's weak. Let the weak say He's not denying the weakness, but he's going to confess something else. Are you getting this? Because you will continue to be weak if you say, I am weak. But you will confess something else if you confess something else. And it works with everything else. If, it, if the Bible says that the weak say, I'm strong, how about this? Let the sick say, I'm healed. I just prayed over this man down here, and I said, I don't want you ever confess that again. He was told me, I have, I have uh, arthritis. And I prayed over him, and I said, I want you to say, I believe I'm healed from it. It doesn't, we're not denying the arthritis. We're not denying the sickness. We're just not going to confess it. And we start confessing health, because what you continue to confess, you will possess. I told this story this morning. I may have shared this before. But a good pastor friend of mine who happens to be a Baptist, he moved out of this area now, but his wife was a mail carrier, and she got terminal cancer. He shared this story with me. I'll tell you, some of these guys share all kinds of stuff with me that they don't want their congregation to know. That's the truth. That's the truth. And he, and he shared with me, he says, my wife had terminal cancer, and she was going to deliver mail until she couldn't deliver mail anymore. And so she's delivering mail, she's weak and she's frail, and she runs into a problem either getting to the mailbox, and there was this fellow out and he was jogging. And he stops to help her, and it just happens he was a Pentecostal. And she tells him his problem, and she, she says, I have cancer. He said, I'm going to stop you right there. He said, I'm going to pray for you right now. And he says, I never want you to ever say, I have cancer again. So he prays for her. She goes home and tells her husband. He's like, hmm. But from that day on, she gets up in the morning and she says, Lord, I thank you. I believe I'm healed of cancer. Nothing changed. She gets up the next day. Lord, I thank you. I believe that I'm healed. Of and before long, this was his own word. She was totally healed of cancer. And she's healed of cancer to this day. Why? Because you will possess what you confess. How about this? How about those? Any, anybody, anybody struggling financially? Wow. Then our offering should be a lot more if that's all of you that are struggling financially. <laughs> that was a trick question right there. <laughs> How about this? Let the poor say... I'm right. Now, it's not denying that you're poverty-stricken. It's not denying that you have money problems. But it says, let the poor say, I am rich. We're not, we're not confessing the poverty, but we're going to start confessing the provision. Amen? Because what you continue to confess, you will possess. My God will supply my need. You look at your paycheck and you say, how in the world am I going to pay the bills? Like Bonnie Kelly, my God, will we start confessing something else besides the poverty. Yeah, that's it. And you're going to possess what you confess. Instead of wringing your hands and worrying and working on Sunday. I mean, some of you have to. I know you work in health care. That's one thing. But because I don't have enough money, you never will. <laughs> I'll tell you that. You start confessing. You start living for the Lord. You start confessing. Hallelujah. How about this one? 
Let the depressed say, I'm full of joy. Sometimes that's the only way you can say it. But say it anyways. What's the matter? I'm full of joy. <laughs> We're not denying the depression. We're just going to confess something else. We're going to confess joy instead. Because if you continue, even if you don't feel like it, even if it doesn't come out like you feel like it, you're going to possess the joy that you confess. And this principle works for generational curses of alcohol, generational curses of drugs, generational curses of, of sickness and disease. It works for all of that. Don't Name it. Don't claim it. Don't confess it. It's, it's what the Bible refers to as calling things that are not as though they are. Who am I? You are, I am, whatever you confess. Now the second Horeb Hill revelation this is the one I want you to get. This is us speaking to God. You, with the emphasis on you. You, God, are I am. This is a revelation of who God is. Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, now watch this progression. Everybody wake up for a moment. Watch this progression. Moses says, who am I? It's three little words of inadequacy, three little words filled with weakness and inferiority. And watch how God turns around these same three words into something powerful and something of all sufficiency. He says, who am I? And the Lord says, I am who? Oh, come on. There was probably 25 people in the first service, and they, when I got to that point, they, who am I? And God says, I am who? You know why? Because God doesn't have an identity crisis. He said, I am who you can always count on. I am who will never fail. I am who is always present. I am who is all powerful. I am who is all knowing. I am who. So when you're facing those moments of doubt and inadequacy and weakness and inferiority, when you're dealing with the who am I, let these words just ring out in your spirit from the Lord. Not who am I, but I am who. I am who loves you. I am who saves you. I am who heals you. I am who delivers you. I am who provides for you. I am who fills you. I am who sustains you. I am who supplies all your needs. Hallelujah. I am who. It is a horrible hill revelation by us of who God is. You are I am. You know what that means? I am who I am. That, that, that's not Popeye, by the way. Almost. Popeye is I am what I am. I am what I am. He, he is what he is, but God is I am who I am. That means he will always be what he's always been. When we don't acknowledge who God is, we sang it this morning, you are stronger. Our God is stronger. When we don't acknowledge who God is, the things that we face in our life will always seem too big, too powerful, and too overwhelming. It's like the 10, ten of the 12 spies. 
that were sent out into the promised land. I love this because it was called the promised land. What does that mean? It's a land that God gave them, a land that God promised to them, a land that God promised that they would conquer. It was the promised land. But when they get there, even though God had his promise for them, a victory in the land, what do they see? They see giants, and they begin to compare themselves to the giants. And at one point they say, there's giants in there, and we seem like grasshoppers in their eyes, and so we were in our own eyes. How you see yourself is how you're going to be. Oh, there's giants everywhere. They're too big. They're too powerful. They're too overwhelming. Why? Because they paired them. They compared themselves to who they compared the giants to who they were instead of comparing the giants to who God was. They didn't acknowledge that you, God, are I am. And so they had to revert to I am a grasshopper. Why? Because they are giants. So what does that mean? That means in essence they were unbelievers. God's people. Unbelievers. When we don't acknowledge who God is in the midst of our troubles... Even though we go to church, we are really unbelieving believers. Now, would you keep your finger here and turn to John chapter 8. I may have shared this before. I share it in the New Believers class. But this is, this is an incredible truth in John chapter 8. When you get there, say amen. Okay, John chapter 8. Look at verse 56. Now, this is Jesus. I'll wait till you get there. Okay, if you haven't gotten there by now, just look intelligently at the page that you're at, and nobody will know. Just hold it like this and nod your head as I'm reading. Okay. You ready? Look at verse 56. This is Jesus talking to the unbelieving religious crowd. And he says to the unbelieving religious crowd, he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw and was glad. Now, the significance of that is that Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus was even born. Now, here Jesus is telling them, Abraham saw my day. He rejoiced, and he saw, and he rejoiced. And the religious leaders say in verse 57, he says, you are not even 50 years old yet. Jesus was in his 30s, and they gave him the benefit of the doubt. They said, you're not even 50 years old, and you're trying to tell us that you've seen, that you've seen Abraham? And then... The most incredible verse in the entire Bible. This is it, right here. And by the way, it is the verse. This is the verse that Jesus got crucified for. Verse 58. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, or in the NIV it says, I tell you the truth, which means that what is following is going to be an incredible, unbelievable truth, but true, nevertheless. And he says this, here it is. Before Abraham was born, I am. Now, if you were just a casual reader of the Word of God and you came across that, you'd say, oh, right there, the Bible's not true. That's a misprint. The grammar is not correct there. It should say, before Abraham was, I was. Jesus knew what he was saying. Before Abraham was born, he says, I am. What was he saying? The Jews knew what he was saying. The religious leaders knew what he was saying. He was saying, I am God. But they didn't believe who he was. And so verse 59 says, therefore they picked up stones to throw at him. And, and, and when Jesus says, I am, there's a lot of people. Let me just back up. There's a lot of people who think that Jesus was a good teacher, a good man, a prophet, whatever. But when he said, I am. He revealed himself not as just a good teacher, not as just a prophet, not as a religious leader, not even as a good man. But he was saying, I am who I am. I am God. And because they didn't receive this revelation, they tried to stone him and ultimately crucified him. Jesus didn't have an identity crisis. 
Seven times in the book of John, he says, I am. He says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He is what you need today. You are, I am, hallelujah. John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. He brings us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we say, you, O oh God, are, I am. John 10, 10, he says, I am the door. You are, I am. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. He cares for you. He leads you. He protects you. And he laid down his life for you. You, oh God, are, I am. John eleven twenty five, 25, he says, I am the re resurrection and the life. He is our confident assurance of eternal life. You are, I am. John 15 5 he says I am the vine he is what provides and sustains us you are I am and listen church in John 14 6 he says I am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father but through me he is the only way to God not Mohammed not Confucius not Buddha not by being good Jesus Christ is the way and he's the only way Jesus Christ is the truth and he's the only truth Jesus Christ is the life and he's the only life hallelujah you are I am hallelujah glory to his name God wants you to know today that anything that you face you are I am he wants you to know here's his answer whatever you're going to I am who I am the third Horeb Hill revelation is you are hyphen with an emphasis on I am. Basically, you are because I am. It's a revelation of who we are in Christ. Verse 12, certainly, or I tell you the truth, I will be with you. Whew. Doesn't get any better than that. Jesus said in John 15 that he would abide in us and we would abide in him. As Christians, we are in Christ and at the same time Christ is in us. In him we live and move and have our being. So he was telling Moses, Moses, I know this is a huge task. I know you're 80 years old. I know you're rusty. I know you're out of touch. But I'm not asking you to do it on your own. I'm not asking you to do it in your own strength, under your own power. I'm asking you to do it in me, in my strength and my power. God knew that he was 80. God knew where he'd been and what he'd been doing for the last 40 years. And he's saying to Moses and he's saying to us as well, listen to this. You are and you can because I am. You are. And you can, because I am. He knows all about us. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our limitations. He knows what we're facing. He knows that apart from him, we can do nothing. Apart from him, we can do nothing on our own, in our own strength, under our own power. But he also knows that with him and through him, that absolutely nothing is impossible. Amen. Christ in us, the hope of glory. When we come to the Horb Hill revelation, to the point in our life where we give up and we say, Lord, I'm not I am. You are I am. And then he turns it around and he says, okay, and now you are and you can because I am. I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens me. Let me tell you something. Nothing is more foundational to your life. To your marriage. To your health. Than the Horb Hill revelation of who you are in Christ. Nothing is more powerful than this. When you are facing uncertainties in your life. When you are facing trials and tribulations and hardship. And if we grasp this Horb Hill revelation about who God is. Look what God says about you. He says, you 
are more than a conqueror. Why? Because I am. You are forgiven because I am. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ because I am. You are a participant in the divine nature of God because I am. You are filled with the Holy Spirit because I am. You are able to overcome anything that comes your way because I am. And church, you are a trophy of grace because I am. Hallelujah. I am who I am. These are three Horb Hill rev revelations that will help us in any situation or any task that we face. A revelation of who we are, a revelation of who God is, and a revelation of who we are in Christ. Would you bow your heads? I assume today that you know where you are. But have you faced the horrible revelation of who you are? Moses said, who am I? If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior and you ask that question to yourself, I can help you answer it. You are a sinner. And you cannot get to heaven on your own. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Who am I? You can be a child of the King today. Would you come if you don't know Jesus Christ? Would you come and have him turn your who am I into a I am who? I am who saves you. I am who died for you. I am who loves you. Come on, if you don't know Christ, would you come? You will never know who you are till you know who God is. If you're facing something in your life, I'm going to ask you to just stand. Whatever it is, problems, situations, turmoil, hardships, uncertainty, fear, health problems, just stand to your feet. Something big. Something life-changing. Something overwhelming. And, and at times, you felt like a grasshopper compared to the giant. I'm going to ask you right where you stand to begin to acknowledge today in the face of your trouble that God is I am he said I am who I am and when you acknowledge that you get his promise that he will be with you and in you and all of a sudden the giants won't look so big the giants compared to God are just jai ants there's nothing that you cannot do there's nothing that you cannot face when you put God into the equation say Lord I'm not but you are I am Pastor Brian would you just pray for these if you would Father we we ask for a change of heart so that we can have a change of speech so that we can have a change of direction so that we can have a change of perspective father i'm asking that lord uh, we know where we are because this is the house of god but i'm asking that the god of the house would change our perspective today lord all those that are standing let them meet the god of the house in a great way let them, let them rustle it out, Lord. Let, us, let them be as Jacob's, Lord, that will not let you go. That will not let you go until you change things. Change them, oh, Father. And I thank you that, that, Lord, there is a change happening right now. We thank you for the change. We thank you for the change of mind, the change of heart, and the change of perspective. 
And let this change, Father. Uh, save marriages. Let this change, Lord. Save situations in our lives. Because, Lord, you're the God of restoration. And we can do this because, because of the great I am today. In Jesus' name, amen.